I'm not going to do. Uh, we are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude the remarks, I will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Um, and, you, and members can also raise their hand to speak. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. And please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Um, for any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. And finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Okay, that's the housekeeping out of the way. So we've had call to order, we've had audio and video announcement, and now I need an approval of the agenda, please. So moved. moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, by roll call, Joe? Aye. Chris? Aye. Peter? Aye. Jill? Hi. George. Thank you, George. You're muted, but next time you won't be. We don't have any uh, minutes to adopt for this meeting. Is there, has there been any updates on any of the committee reports that anybody wants to share? I'm seeing a no shaking of heads from everyone. Okay, thank you. So um, first up on our agenda is the County Finance Review Committee review of the fiscal year 22 county budget. And with that, I will turn it over to our town's finance director, Brian Turbett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll share my screen here. Oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, let me find it here, over here. And it's not letting me share right now. So hold on one second, please. I'm glad this doesn't only happen to me. Uh, no, it doesn't actually. I, I do apologize. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so the county budget um, was adopted on January 27th, 2021 by the county commissioners and we're now before the county review board to review it and um, also to request your adoption of the budget. <clears throat> the county is made up of county administration, registry of deeds, which is administration and deeds excise <clears throat> and the revenue sources are town assessment, deeds excise revenue, recording fees, corrections deed excise, which is dedicated to the public safety facility, registry of deeds, excise fund balance, and or county fund balance if we projected that it was necessary. <clears throat> Projected revenue for fiscal 22 town assessment, $174,455, which is a small increase of about 2.5% over last year's number of 170,201. These excise receipts estimated at $478,125 with the breakdown between county administration, 286,875 and the registry of 191,250. Recording fees of 171,500 and then corrections deeds excise, which is the uh, collections for the two up 250, 250,000, excuse me, which is for the payment for the public safety facility. All told projected revenue of $1,074,180. <clears throat> the county funding requirement, also known as maintenance of effort by law, the county must provide a certain amount of non deeds excise revenue to the registry. The amount does increase by two and a half percent per year and the fiscal 22 county funding requirement was based on a the starting point of three hundred forty six thousand fifty five dollars and this year we are providing one hundred and seventy four thousand of non deeds excise revenue um, to meet that, that requirement. Projected expenses county administration two hundred fifty eight thousand nine hundred eighty four dollars which is no change from the prior year. There's no employees in the county itself. The main expenses are all legal and professional services. <clears throat> registry of deeds, $511,234. There are three full-time employees in the registry. 
administrative expenses as well as any deeds excise or special projects that they may undertake public safety facility debt service related to the two four fairgrounds of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars all told projected expenses of one million twenty thousand two hundred and eighteen dollars and the last side compares it to what was approved last year you can see there actually i do apologize there's a twenty dollar increase in the county administration over last year small increase in payroll in the registry from 403,000 to 416,000, which is mainly cost of benefits and any anticipated increases to um, employees wages. Operating expenses uh, went up about $3,000 from 45,088 to 48,557. Total expenses in the registry of $465,282. <clears throat> Deeds excise expenses have increased um, about $8,000 due to some uh, additional work that we need to do um, that the registrar has asked to consider of $45,952. So the total registry budget of 511,234, along with the 250,000 for debt service, gets us to the $1,020,218, which is about $25,000 more than the prior year. <clears throat> the next steps, um, I'm sorry, this was actually supposed to be on the second and we moved to the fourth. Um, as I mentioned, the county commissioners recommended and adopted the budget on the 27th of January and we're before you tonight for consideration and adoption of the budget. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Any questions? And I only see some of you now because of share screen. So I, will, I can take that off, Madam Chair. Okay, thanks, Brian. You're welcome. Okay, Joe, any questions? Nope. Peter? No. Nope. He said no. Jill? So, Jill? yeah, I just had one. I just don't know this budget very well. So I'm just asking the basics as I usually do. The three time, the three full time employees, mm -hmm. I mean, this is saying that they take $416,000 in payroll. Uh, that includes insurances and every everything it is not just payroll so it's any payroll taxes in, in cost of health benefits and retirement as well so it's not just salary it's all all ancillary uh, personnel benefits are in that line okay and do you think that they're going to need to hire more people I mean it just seems like this year they've had a huge increase in reporting um, during town administration's discussion with the registrar, they, there was no indication that they needed um, an addition, any additional staffing right now. Okay. Um, okay, I, I think that's it. I get confused on the county budget because I don't really understand how the public safety and then the deeds and it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me that those are connected, but <laughs> that's, I guess, just how you do it. Yeah. Um, well, that was an agreement when I believe, and Libby can correct me if I'm wrong, when the, the Commonwealth took over all of the sheriffs, there was an agreement that they would contribute for the life of the debt 250000 towards the construction of the public safety facility. Um, and that's where the money is collected from and then transferred to, to pay the debt. Okay. All right. That makes sense. It, it goes way back. And it, it is on the surface seemingly odd, but it, it has a history. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Thanks, Jill. George, any questions? None. No. Chris? No, I'm good. Thanks. And Peter, I can't remember. I probably asked you already. I'm asking you again. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. No questions from my side. So um, I, we need a motion to approve. So moved. moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. Joe? Aye. Jill? Aye. Peter? Aye. Chris? Aye. George? Aye. Denise? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. I now need a motion to adjourn the County Review Committee meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Joe? Aye. Aye. Jill? Aye. Peter? Aye. Chris? Aye. George? Aye. Aye. The meeting is adjourned. Now we will 
continue with the regular finance committee meeting. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so first up is on the, so we are, we had three um, citizen warrant articles scheduled for today. And the first one up is Megan Glowacki's new bylaw, safety of drinking water. Megan is not attending, but I believe um, Mr. Mandel, I believe you wanted to say some, say something in respect of this article. Is that true? Um, no, I'm just interested in this, obviously, because of the, the PFAS issues that uh, are starting to come up in Madiket. And uh, her article uh, simply addresses Wana Comet's ability to test and their, and their uh, contamination levels that they'll test to. Uh, so I'm just here as an interested observer, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're actually, we had actually discussed it at a prior meeting and as Megan mm -hmm. is not here, we don't have any, she did send out some materials. Is there anything that anyone on the committee wants to add to our prior discussion? I don't see any hands raised, so we will move on to the next article. Uh, Thomas, uh, we're now, um, I would invite you to discuss your town meeting warrant change, uh, the charter amendment, please. Uh, basically just changing the uh, mailing from, um, from seven days to 14 days, basically it's just uh, get it uh, so that it could be mailed out earlier so that more people can get the warrant article earlier so they have time to read it so they can actually maybe make an effort to attend town meeting when we get back to a normal schedule. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone on the committee who have any questions for Mr. Bereda? Uh, Peter Schaefer. That's for, more for Libby. Was there a reason that it was only sent out seven days ahead? That is how the charter was written initially in 1996. Um, okay, so just following the rules then. Yeah, it's just following the rules. And, um, you know, we try to get it to the um, printer and the, and the printer then sends it to the mail place. And we do that about three to four weeks ahead of the seven days. And, um, you know, it does take time to get the warrant printed. It does take time to prepare it for mailing and then mailing it. And once it gets to the post office, it's anyone's guess as to how quickly it gets out to the voters. So um, this, if passed, will necessitate a um, addition of time to the overall schedule. So we're gonna be starting earlier um, than we normally do, which, you know, it, it is what it is, I guess. But, but no cost implication or anything like that? I don't know that there would be any cost implications, no. Okay. Thank you. Peter, any other questions? Jill? How, I don't remember, but how soon is the warrant up online? Like, is that still, is that also just seven days or? The warrant goes online as soon as it, goes to the printer. When it's ready to go to the printer, it goes online. It says way ahead of seven days. Yeah. So it's already accessible to the public well in advance of seven days. Yes. Thank you. I mean, obviously through all this as well, but mm -hmm. the final words. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Joe? Uh, just a question for Tom, Thomas Barada. Thomas, do you have any, um, I don't know, information uh, other than anecdotal information that the public feels that seven days is insufficient and 14 is quote unquote better? Um, as being a recipient of getting the warrant article in the mail, I've gotten it on the Friday before a Monday town meeting. So it shows up on a Friday and people, you know, you run into people and people say, when's town meeting? Oh, it's on Monday. You got to be yeah. kidding. I just got it. So, you know, if we want to try to get more people to participate, it's one way to get them. As far as it being electronic, yes, I realize that it is electronic version, but there's a lot of people that like the paper version to be able to actually sit and read it and not have to have it on their electronic device 
It's easier to read in the living room with the kids running around and stuff like that. Thank you. Any other questions? I know my observation is if we can send it, if we can send it earlier, then yes, it'll push the schedule back a week. And it seems like it would be a workable thing to be able to do. So um, yeah, okay, good. We're not going to make any motions today um, on these articles. We'll be doing that in March when we do all of them. So Mr. Bereda, thanks for attending and thanks for explaining why you put this article in. And um, yeah, very helpful. Thank you a lot. I appreciate your being here. Thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the amend general bylaws uh, for the sign. Um, so Mr. Kuster, Kev may I call you Kevin? Yes. We ask people that when I just go ahead and call them by their first names. So um, Kevin, I'll ask you to explain to the committee the logic behind your uh, Citizen Warren article and why you think it's a good proposal for the town of Nantucket. Well, it, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here and for listening to this. Um, this is relatively simple. Uh, it's all about getting some regulation in place so that when decisions are made to put signs up, um, you know, regulatory signs and so forth, that that we use the minimum sizes that are allowable. Um, and we try to limit the number and the position of them that are also close together. I'm sure most of you have probably heard about all of the various, you know, complaints about all the signs that went up on Milestone Road. I understand that's a state road and that this doesn't qualify for that. But as we continue to improve our roads around town and around the island, I think it's just important to have something in place that says, you know, look, we want to use the minimum size um, and we want to use the colors uh, that are that are only necessary to use, you know, the day glow yellow and the day glow greens when they're absolutely required. Uh, and in most cases, they're not. There are some cases where they are. So um, that's basically what this is. It's relatively simple. It shouldn't cost any more money. It should save a little bit of money. Um, and it's something that I think if we can get on the books, um, it's perhaps been a low priority for a while, but this will be something that gets it in place so that we can get it taken care of. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, questions from the Finance Committee? No questions. Joe? All right. Um, actually, a question for Libby. I think, Libby, you, you circulated an email, I think it was earlier today, that, that sort of commented on, on Kevin's article and the, the gist of it, of both your feedback and I think uh, the DVW was that we sort of already kind of minimize, you know, the, the sign sizes and the, um, the use of unattractive colors as best we can. Is that, is that already sort of an unwritten rule in the town? I just. Um, I would say, I would say generally yes, unless it's a state project, which the state is running, in which case they have regulatory requirements that have to be followed and they typically ensure that such signs are installed. They are temporary, they're not permanent. Um, I just would mention comments from police and public works on this article that the gist of it is that the signs are installed for safety purposes. And it's a little bit unclear like um, in, in what manner would we, I mean, the, the signs I think Kevin is talking about, maybe you can clarify, are, are temporary signs. I don't think we have any fluorescent signs that are permanently up and they're up for the duration of the project. Um, some signage needs to be visible when there are fog and dark and rainy maybe conditions. So there we need to rely on them to meet visibility guidelines and reduced visibility situations. The size, shape, and number we recommend are in conformance with the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, um, which applies to roadways nationwide, pretty much. We know that Nantucket has its own you know, way of handling signs and that we're very particular about them, but there is some concern about legal implications if 
we don't install signs specifically intended for safety purposes. So that was really just a comment. Uh, George? Uh, I'd just like to remind everybody to think back a little bit about what the traffic was like 10 years ago and what it is now. And the signs are the controlling mechanism in most cases. Um, speaking as somebody just as myself, when I drive large trucks around here, it becomes enormously uh, scary sometimes. And uh, I'm not, a, and, and, and you can't, you can't ignore the, uh, the two wheel traffic or the people in the electric powered uh, skateboards that are out there. And they're not required to do anything. So all of the responsibility falls on the, on the driver. Um, and that should be factored, I think, into everyone's thoughts on this. Thank you, George. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Thomas, I, I will um, come to you in a minute. Um, I just want to get through all of the FinCom members first to ask you. Anybody else on FinCom have a comment before uh, Chris? Yeah, I'm just curious about the manual on uniform traffic control devices. That's not a statement, right? That's more of just a, a guideline. It's a guideline that's recommended for all traffic control devices that towns, cities and towns follow um, with respect to safety issues. And if you don't follow them, you could have potential liability. Okay, thanks, Libby. Joe? Just, just a, a comment. The, the reason I asked that question is, is um, you know, I think Mr. I think most of us feel that, you know, Nantucket has a certain, um, you know, ambiance and a certain sort of sense of culture. And, and obviously um, most people would rather not have obtrusive and really unattractive road signs if we don't necessarily, don't really, really have to have them. Uh, I'm just wondering whether, to be perfectly honest, amending bylaws is kind of using a hammer to kill a fly here on this situation. And that, um, you know, if, if, if there's some other way to you know, make you know, uh, Kevin feel comfortable that the town is using all uh, possible ways to minimize the obtrusiveness of signs. Um, you know, maybe maybe you, he could feel more comfortable that we're we're already doing that and don't really need to amend the town's bylaws to to you know sort of put this enforcement in place. But one man's opinion. So. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else from FinCom? Uh, Thomas, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, one quick question. Um, and this was raised by a couple people in the past, and I never really gotten uh, asked the question. But is there a reason why the speed limit signs on the island aren't reflective, unlike uh, all the other traffic control signs that are around? Uh, rotary ahead, uh, the stop signs are reflective, um, crosswalk signs are reflective, but none of the speed limit signs around the island are actually have any reflectiveness for night driving. And I'm just curious, do the, don't those fall under the uniform code of signage that they should be? I, I am personally not sure about that. I would have to check. This is okay. I was gonna say, Libby, I expect you to know that manual backwards and forwards and be able to explain this to us. It's a good question, um, and we can check on it, Thomas, and come back and come back to you on it. Thank you. Sure. I, if I think about it, when I'm off island, which is never right now, uh, I don't know if speed limit signs are reflective anywhere else. But I haven't been off island for almost a year, so who knows? Um, Mr. 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 Bruce, you wanted to say something? Yes, I did. I, quick question. I've submitted a few citizens articles in the past, including one that's coming up. And I've always had to try to put together some kind of a finance report that spells out if there might be any financial impact to the article. And I was wondering if an article such as this uh, has such an implication. Thank you for that. And it's a questionnaire that the Finance Committee had put together several years ago, and it's voluntary for folks to fill it out. And so that's why we also, we, we very much appreciate when we get them and not everyone does. So yes, Hillary, you raised your hand. 
Yes. Hi. Thanks. Um, I I helped Kevin with this uh, with this article. So um, signs are something I care a lot about, as do a number of people. A lot of people on Nantucket care about signs. Um, and the reason why I came to be somewhat knowledgeable to the extent that I am about the signs is because I did a ton of work um, researching the Milestone Road signs, how that sign plan came to be. Um, and I also reviewed in detail the safety um, audit of Milestone Road that led to the suggestion of um, installing those signs. Um, and I learned a number of interesting things. So. I learned, first of all, that signs have a very low safety benefit. Um, the, the Some signs are, are have a higher safety benefit, signs that let motorists know that a um, an intersection is coming up have a higher safety benefit. Uh, but um, a lot of the, like the deer warning signs, you know, deer don't cross at the signs. Um, you know, a speed limit sign is informative if you haven't already seen it. So, so most of the signs that were put up on Milestone Road were actually indicated in um, the safety audit to have a low safety benefit, but they went up anyway. Um, all of those signs were specified by a contract engineer. I also had the opportunity to review the plan for the Surfside and Bartlett Road roundabout, um, which the town has decided to deprioritize and that won't be happening, but there was a, um, I think it was a 25% uh, uh, finished uh, plan, and it included recommended signage, a sign production plan. And some of you may remember the Sparks roundabout that was covered with signs before people from the town <laughs> waited for it to be inspected and then took the signs down. Um, but the the uh, Surfside Bartlett Road roundabout had a sign plan, and uh, every sign that was in there was bigger than the minimum recommended sign. And the in the MUT MU. Um, CTD uh, manual on traffic control. So what I'm uh, saying basically is that we're in a situation where we have off island designers coming in and um, designing these signs and making these sign plans and they're going by their books. They don't even necessarily come here. It's not necessarily the lead designer, or the lead engineer on the project that's doing the sign plan. These are really, really detailed technical engineering plans. Um, and they, um, they have categories of signs. Um, sometimes the minimum sign is 30 inches ac across, sometimes it's 24, um, but often the engineers don't select the minimum size sign. And Nantucket is a low speed um, rural community, but we're not getting these smaller signs because we're not asking for them. Um, additionally, uh, signs are required to be fluorescent at pedestrian crossings in school zones, but they're not required to be fluorescent anywhere else. Um, so you'll notice some fluorescent signs kind of creeping in in other places. Um, if you're going along Orange Street from the Milestone Rotary approaching um, Marine Home, right where the in-town bike path goes over to Goose Pond, you'll notice uh, fluorescent, large fluorescent um, signs, both a crossing ahead and a crossing sign. That's the other thing, these warning signs that are coming up and they're, you know, 30, 40 feet ahead of the crosswalk. So you can actually see the crosswalk and you can see the second sign when you're approaching it. So, you know, signs don't control traffic. We're going to have traffic signs give people notice. Some signs are more valuable than others. Um, signs are installed based on engineering judgment. Um, this, this bylaw would not um, make it impossible for, or would not prevent Nantucket from complying with the MUTCD. The MUTCD doesn't tell you where you have to put the signs. It doesn't tell you that you have to put any signs. It just tells you if you're going to put a sign, what the allowable sizes are for signs and how they need to look. And they actually do need to be reflective now. So if we have non-reflective signs, it's because they're old. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about what I know about signs, um, what I've read about signs, what I've read on Nantucket and learned on Nantucket about signs. Um, and I do think we need to have a bylaw about signs because I think that these details um, of signs are very important 
for the aesthetics, um, the natural beauty and the character of our island, which is frankly important for the economy of the island. Um, and I think that it just, if you're just thinking about it from a cost perspective, this will save money. <laughs> um, signs are getting bigger because lobbyists want signs to get bigger. Um, so I, I, that's basically what I have to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hillary. And but Hillary, uh, quick question. Do you know if about the speed limit signs, if they have to be reflective? All they signs can... need to be reflective. So if the speed limit signs are not reflective, it's because they're probably old. Okay. Thomas, I think this is the first time we've been able to have a follow-up point and be able to answer it right in the meeting. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, Peter, you have a question? Yeah, Hillary, um, what kind of lobbyist is lobbying for signs and what are they lobbying for? You know, <laughs> I can't answer that. Okay, it's just a, you're just a quip. It Thank was you. a quip, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. It was a somewhat informed quip from people who, you know, invest in industrial companies and have a view on, on lobbyists. Thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Um, Kevin, I have a, uh, okay, Chris. Chris, go ahead, and then I have a question for Kevin. Yeah, I'm really a question for you, Denise, or the board, or maybe Libby. I mean, I just wonder if there's any other town agency that might have some input into this from the aesthetic uh, and historical aspect, you know, HTC or someone like that. Um, you know, we're, we hear from the safety side, but we also know that there are a lot of people that are expert on the aesthetic side and, and worried about that asset for uh, our community. And I just wonder if it, um, anyone else could be brought into this conversation. I think it's, um, you know, this notion of uh, mitigating risk, you you can take that to to the end of the earth, and obviously we already make um, we we make compromises on that on Nantucket, or else we would have stoplights and flashing lights and a whole bunch of other things that um, we have somehow decided not to have. So we we do make those decisions to to trade one off against the other, and I think it's an interesting conversation. So that follows on to my question with you, Kevin. Have you spoken to the police chief or to the historic? Commission or to the Historic District Commission about this and their thoughts on this? Um, well, actually, yes. I I happen to you know also be on the you know the Town Sign Advisory Council, uh, and I've been on that in that group, which is an advisory group to the HDC. Um, I've been on that group for about seven years, and we look at and approve all the sign applications for all the signs that go up on Nantucket. Um, including, you know, street signs and signs for the town and those sorts of things. Um, every, you know, member of, of our committee, uh, you know, would like to see this done. Um, we have found that when we have to enforce other guidelines for signs, that having a real clear direction and having a policy just makes it all that much easier. So this is basically what this is all about is just having the bylaw reflect, you know, what the minimum, you know, sizes can be that we, that we don't want to see things be heavy handed. Um, and in no way does, do we want to see anything compromising safety? Um, so I think it's kind of an extension in a way um, from the, from the sign guidelines that we already implement for the HDC. And this is just a way to, to kind of carry some of that forward. Thank you. Jill, you had raised your hand or no? Were you just waving at me? <laughs> well, I liked waving at you, Denise, but no, I was just wanted to say I supported Chris's question and yours because I wanted to see if the sign committee had weighed in on it, but I guess the sign committee, one of the members of the sign committee is leading the charge. So Kevin, I guess my big question and, or Hillary, how would it, things look different from how they look now? Can you give us like three or four examples of things that you find particularly offensive that might be removed or made smaller that you feel like is responsible? You have something, Hillary, or? You're on well, I actually did put together a, um, like a, an example of some signs that would go away, um, which I can, mail to Denise if you want, Denise, follow up. Um, but for one, um, the important point is signs at a pedestrian crosswalk would never go away. You could always, always, always put a sign at a pedestrian crosswalk. And if it's in a school zone, it can be a fluorescent sign. 
um, it needs to be 24 inches across. So a lot of our signs are 30 inches across or bigger. Um, so going forward, we would be asking, and this is actually consistent with what the DPW is doing. They, all of the new pedestrian crosswalk signs that you see going up, that they're 24 inches across, they're yellow, orange, they're great and helpful, and they would continue to be there. Um, the signs that would not go up are the signs that tell you 30 feet before you get to the crosswalk that there's a pedestrian crosswalk. We think that um, speeds are low on Nantucket. Uh, they should be low. <laughs> and especially in areas where pedestrians are crossing, um, there's often a lot of activity around. Um, so we think that one sign at the crosswalk is, is sufficient and that extra signs just increase sign kind of clutter. Um, the deer signs and other warning signs, these are signs that are yellow. Um, they would need to be a thousand feet apart. So if it's a thousand feet from another sign, it can be there. Um, we just don't want clusters of signs. So if you think about um, going, you know, down Milestone Road, there's portions at the beginning of Milestone Road where it's just a sign, a sign, a sign, a sign. So that's kind of, that's what we're trying to get away from. Um, and then some of the signs would get smaller, but they would never be needing to be smaller than what is allowed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think, Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, yeah, through you. I think that uh, just adding on to that, that um, you, would, you would see hopefully uh, fewer and you would see uh, somewhat smaller. Um, it's sort of similar in a way to other guidelines that are out there. For instance, if you want to put a dormer on your house, it has to be two feet in from, you know, the edge. It can't be right up to the edge. And somebody could say, well, what if it's six inches more? It's like, well, no, that's not what it calls for. So it's about sort of taking the minimal approach and the standard approach that hopefully in all of its totality has an impact of being simpler and, and a little less cluttered. Um, you know, one of the things that the sign committee and I think the HDC has done a has done a good job of is that we have a policy for no freestanding signs anywhere. Now you're going to see some that are grandfathered in, and you know they're that's why they're there. Um, so this is just kind of you know trying to get you know something in place that says when we do need to put signs up that they're absolutely necessary and that they're the minimum size and the simplest color palette you know, that's allowable by the standards. Um, pretty Thank simple. You. Thank you. You know, you know, it might be, it might be a bit of a sledgehammer, but I also think it's just kind of good housekeeping. It's a way to get it taken care of so that it's, it's off of everybody's plate and we know what we're getting going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the members of the finance committee? No. Okay. In which case, um, so on our agenda, that's our last topic for today. Um, so is there any other business? I don't see anyone raising their hand. Our next meeting is Saturday, starting at 8.15, and it'll run till about probably about 1.30 or so as the schedule goes. We're doing the departmental budget reviews, and I look forward to seeing, it'd be, we're, of course, part, um, we're happily having anyone join in for these reviews. So that will be Saturday morning. And Denise, will you be sending coffee to each of our houses? I or am, Chris. I'll be there at 6.30 bringing the coffee and donuts. What about donuts? Have. Donuts. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll add that too. <laughs> Great, thank you. So have, have, Kevin, it, have it delivered to our home? <laughs> oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> of course. I, you know, I, um, I'm going to get on my bike at about... Uh, <laughs> Six o'clock in the morning to make sure you all get your coffee and donuts. No, sorry, this year you don't. Joe, Joe, you had a question. Actually, pr probably the re same reason. I've had some issues getting into the uh, OpenGov um, program uh, uh, website. I'm curious, Brian, have you and Brian and I chatted on the phone before this meeting? Do you have any update on? Not yet. I sent an email to them. Um, some of the. Joe's having a problem because some of the hyperlinks aren't bringing up all the data, which I cannot understand why, because I've republished it three times when I was working with them. So um, 
I'm going to download them and send them to him. If anyone else has a problem between now and Saturday, let me know and I will um, send you the data that you're looking for. I was also just going to let you know that we have sent, uh, Madam Chair, that we have sent NCTV um, the list for the pa for panelists and we're expecting that that link will, that, that will come out tomorrow for everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I mean, at the time I was clicking on things, it was working fine, but yeah. It's yeah, I, I, I had particular, um, some of the enterprise funds, the solid waste and the sewer uh, budget detail didn't show. And um, yeah, I've got, I, I mean, I have reached out to OpenGov because I was using the same link as Joe was and it was working on some of them for me, but not for him. So I'm trying to sort through what's going on. Okay, <clears throat> good. Okay, so um, before we ask for a motion to adjourn, I want to say thank Terry and Libby and Rick and Brian, as, you, as always, thanks for the excellent prep and for sending out the packet of all the information. It actually was very helpful, Rick, to have the uh, text of the articles in our packet. I do have a nice big binder that I work from, but it's, I'm sure it was quite helpful for anyone following along to have the text right there. So thank you for that, that's an improvement. And with that, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. second. Okay, Joe? Uh, aye. Jill? You're muted, Jill. You're muted, Jill. Aye. <laughs> thank you. Chris? Aye. Peter? Aye. George? Aye. Denise, I thank you, everyone, and we'll see you Saturday. See you Saturday. Thanks. Bye. See you. Hey, Brian, I can't, that the link that you showed me, I can't open it either. It just comes up blank at that point. Like, it has the graphs.